This two-part video series is going to attempt to unravel the chronology of the events that take place in the forest and make sense of all the little clues and details about the story. This is going to be incredibly spoiler heavy, so if you haven't yet beaten the game and you don't want it spoiled, you may just want to bookmark this video until you do so. But for those of you that do want to know just what exactly is going on, let's jump into it. Some time ago during the late 19th or early 20th century, missionaries, explorers, and religious zealots began arriving on the peninsula. It's not clear whether they were there to proselytize to the native tribes or explore the expansive cave system, but the various structures around the peninsula suggest that it may have been inhabited by some indigenous groups prior to the arrival of those first explorers. These early expeditions led to the discovery of an ancient artifact deep within the caves, very ominous and supernatural in appearance, something that you might read about in a Lovecraft novel. The artifact inspired awe and fear in those that saw it, and rumors about its existence began to spread and brought many different explorers to the area. Some people came to worship it, others wanted to unravel its secrets and discover its purpose, and some visitors were just avid spelunkers. The peninsula had been featured in different magazines over the years as being a destination for cave exploration. But the artifact wasn't the only sinister thing lurking in those caves. Sightings of horribly disfigured monsters and cannibals were reported, and many of the explorers to the area were killed. Others found ways to barricade themselves in the caves for safety, while an unfortunate few stayed hidden until they fell to starvation, their bodies remaining hidden for decades. The monsters and cannibals were extremely violent, and evidence of their practices of human dismemberment can be seen in effigies all over the peninsula. Dated sculptures made from human skulls and bones imply that they lived in the area as early as those first travelers, or even prior to their arrival. It's not known whether the early drawings and photographs of the creatures ever made it off the peninsula, but explorers and campers to the area were not deterred. There are campsites from film crews, cave spelunkers, and leisurely groups roasting marshmallows, all of which appear to have met grisly and untimely deaths. At some point in time, there was a catastrophic event that led to the death of any remaining inhabitants in the area, their vaporized skeletons frozen, still shielding their eyes and faces. It may have been after this event that a company called Sahara Therapeutics began to show interest in the rumors surrounding the artifact. Rumors about its power to heal the sick, raise the dead, and grant immortality. After their successful expedition to locate it, they purchased the peninsula and began to build a laboratory around the artifact. It's not certain what Sahara Therapeutics' intentions with the artifact were, but they may have known of the rumors on how to operate it. The sinister nature of the artifact was that it could only be activated by enclosing a living child inside. The child would be impaled and killed as the doors closed on them, a reservoir beneath their feet to collect their blood. There is no way to know what the artifact's original purpose was, but we do know that it was being used for child sacrifice. Nevertheless, Sahara saw it as a viable investment and placed Dr. Matthew Cross in charge of experimenting with it. In order to obtain test subjects, he created the Jairus Project, which was probably first marketed as a program to heal terminally ill children. These initial test subjects may have been sick children whose parents had volunteered them for participation in clinical trials at the facility, where they were relocated to and continued receiving medical treatment. It's possible that Matthew began experimenting with the artifact by using a living child to revive one that had died, and then reviving the child killed in the artifact with another living child, creating a cycle of sacrificing children to bring others back to life. After the process, they were placed in observation rooms where they began to develop genetic mutations, ranging from grotesque physical deformities to highly exponential growth rates. These genetic mutations were isolated and studied for their possible applications in other fields, such as cloning and adult longevity. During the construction of the lab, or sometime during Sahara's initial investigation of the artifact, a second artifact was discovered further off in an adjoining cave. An email from Matthew states that the second artifact may possibly have the power to bring down planes, but it's unknown if he actually did this. The facility was expanded to include a room for the second artifact, which could then be operated from a control panel. Matthew Cross had a very tumultuous relationship with his wife, Jessica. Despite a restraining order against him, he continued to contact her while working at the facility, even threatening her at one point if she filed for divorce. Together they had a daughter, Megan, whom he was also prohibited from seeing. Sometime after giving a presentation on the possible applications for the Jairus project, Matthew received a letter of termination for unethical and inappropriate use of equipment. He was instructed to leave the facility, to which he did so without incident. He may have at this time tried to visit or even kidnap his daughter, and we can assume in a fit of rage he murdered her and fled the scene. 
After Megan's death was discovered and an autopsy performed, Matthew stole her body with the intention of reviving her at the Sahara lab. Making his way back to the facility, he disguised himself as one of the mutants, covering his body in red paint, which was a practice he developed while working at the lab after seeing the submissive reaction it prompted from the mutated test subjects. After compromising the exterior of the facility and letting the test subjects escape and terrorize the lab, all of the Sahara employees were killed. And while a large number of the staff was able to retreat or hide in the caves, they didn't survive for long. After the fall of the lab, Matthew, knowing that he'd have to obtain a child in order to revive his daughter, uses a second artifact to bring down a plane. And it's this plane that the character you play as, Eric LeBlanc, is traveling on with his son, Timmy. After the plane crash, Eric witnesses Matthew kidnapping his son and sets out to rescue him. Eric, a skilled survivalist and author of a book on the subject, has little trouble traversing the peninsula in search of his son. When Matthew returns to the facility with Timmy and revives his daughter, she may have fled from him upon her revival, staying hidden in the vents for an amount of time before descending to kill Matthew. It's sometime shortly after Matthew's death that Eric discovers the Sahara lab and finds Megan. After she unsuccessfully tries to communicate with him, she begins to mutate into a creature resembling the ones from the Sahara experiments. Eric unfortunately has no other option but to kill her, and after he does, he brings her body back to the artifact but learns that it can only work with a living child. Following Matthew's path to the second artifact, Eric arrives at the control panel and hesitates briefly before deciding to use the device to bring down a plane. A year later, Eric is invited to appear on a talk show to discuss his ordeal on his rescue, his son Timmy next to him. But during a demonstration, his son drops to the ground in convulsions, and it's implied that the same mutation that happened to Megan is now happening to Timmy as well. And that concludes my theory of the forest. In my second video, I'll go into greater detail about every single clue. We'll discuss the meaning of the red paint, the missing children of the peninsula, the significance of the Louis Vuitton luggage, and so much more. So go ahead and check out that video for an even deeper look into the game. Thank you very much for watching. This is all my personal speculation, so don't take any of it as fact. And I'm sure I will have some updates later, but yeah, that's uh, just what I think. So I hope you enjoyed the video. Bye.